All right, well, why don't, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, it is a little after uh, 5.30. Uh, thank you for coming this Constitution Date. Uh, this is an event that celebrates the September 17th Constitution Day that occurred earlier this week. And you might recall this is the day marking the 225th anniversary of when the members of the Constitutional Convention signed the U.S. Constitution. Um, my name is Stephen Scoltetti. I'm the chair of the Department of Philosophy and Religion. Um, and just before I introduce tonight's speaker, just give me one moment uh, uh, to thank all those who made tonight's event possible. Um, first, given the, the tight budget uh, that we work under, it just would not have been possible to host tonight's event without the generous support of the University of Mississippi Law School, uh, the University of Mississippi Declaration of Independence Center for the Study of American Freedom, and especially uh, the Jack Miller Center for Teaching America's Founding Principles in History. Um, in fact, uh, the Jack Miller Center not only provided most of the funding for tonight's event, but also provided about 100 free copies of the Constitution and Declaration. And so I've put them in an easy access bowl uh, by the door here. And so feel free to grab a copy on your way out. Um, and also, when you do stop by to pick uh, up a copy, it would be great uh, if you could leave your name and email address on one of the sign-up sheets by the door so I can let you know about directly about future events like this one and also uh, just brainstorm about other things we could do about Constitution Day going forward, like maybe starting a, a reading group um, and planning other sorts of events. So it would be great if um, I could contact you. So if you can, just leave your, leave your uh, name and email with, with me. All right, well, let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Scott Yainer, uh, received, uh, who received his PhD from Loyola University in Chicago, is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Political Science at Boise State University in Idaho. He teaches political philosophy, is the Director of the American Founding Initiative at Boise State, and he's published extensively uh, in political uh, philosophy. In fact, he recently came out with a book dealing with the way in which the family is depicted in modern political thought. But besides publishing in political science, uh, Scott is truly, and I, I, I'm not making this up, this is something I'm saying it's true and from the heart, Scott really is one of these incredibly admirable professors who refuses uh, to be pigeonholed into some small, dark, obscure disciplinary alley. Um, he's written and given presentations on a variety of subjects, including the Scottish Enlightenment, the Philosophic Status of Revealed Religion, American Religion. He's one of a Willa Cather expert. Um, and he also has lots of interesting ideas about memes that appear in different Western films. Um, um, so Scott is, a, is a, just a wonderful, kind person. He's also extremely smart, and I'm sure you're in for a real treat with tonight's lecture. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Scott Yainer to the podium, where he'll present The American Founders and the Problem of Wisdom. Thanks uh, for everyone coming. I understand it's rush week. Um, so uh, tonight also is Boise State's football game against Brigham Young. And so I'm missing that. Uh, several of you guys are missing rush week, so we're all sacrificing uh, for the greater good. And um, so thank you for coming. I'm the first Boise State employee to come here since Houston Nutt, I understand, who was uh, first uh, football coach at Boise State. He was lured away by Arkansas, and then I understand here and then dumped. Hopefully I'll be treated better or deserve to be treated better, I don't know. Um, so my talk tonight is on the American founders and the problem of wisdom. The American Constitution is based on a particular understanding of human nature. What is government, James Madison asked in Federalist 51, but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? The long-term success of the American Constitution certainly suggests that it suits human nature better than, say, the Soviet Constitution of Stalinist days, or the first, second, third, or fourth Constitution of France. The fact that the American Constitution survives, where so many have failed, does not seal the deal on the argument that it is a better reflection of human nature. It is, however, more than a little suggestive. Tonight, I will argue that the American Constitution, as originally designed, reflects human nature best 
and that its endurance is related to that reflection. And I want to be equally clear about what I am not arguing up front. I am not arguing that the Constitution survives because it is a living Constitution or because it is filled with vague generalities that allow for infinite growth and flexibility. This is the progressive view, traceable in the American context to John Dewey. That view denies the permanence in the Constitution precisely because it denies there is permanence in human nature. Dewey and his epigones have long argued that the Constitution shackles government's power to make human beings anew or to bring about a new individualism. These thoughts, I will argue at the end of my talk, are part and parcel of a prevalent, insidious threat to our constitutional order, one that is particularly at issue today. The American founders were familiar with species of this threat and provided arguments that tell against certain progressive institutions, but we'll get to that later on. Let us look at what the founders built and why they built it before we defend their vision against today's progressive critics. First, we need to define some terms for the purposes of defending the proposition that the Founders' Constitution is the best reflection of human nature. Let me start by talking about the Founders' view on human nature. In some ways, the Founders' staunchest advocates today have been a liability to the Founders because those advocates offer too constraining a reading of the Founders' view on this topic. The American founders saw human nature as a series or complex of permanent problems. The institutions that the founders wrought reflect and deal with these permanent problems. What are these problems? The, uh, the immediate context of the Madison quotation I mentioned above, what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature, reveals part of the answer to this question of what human nature is. Human beings are morally imperfect, and they are taken with motives contrary to the public good. Human beings are partisans of some sort, in that they favor their friends, and they invest much in their understanding of justice. What prompts Madison's reflections on human nature is his defense of the checks and balances necessary to maintain an effective separation of powers. Let us look at the context of Madison's famous quotation. This is all Madison here. The great security against the gradual concentration of several powers in the same department consists in giving those who administer each department the necessary constitutional means and the personal motives to resist the encroachment of others. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The interests of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary uh, to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections of human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself." End quote. Human beings in private and in public are imperfect exemplars of human virtue and imperfect servants of the public good. The institution that Madison and his colleagues set up would supply the defect of better motives by aligning the human desire for power to the constitutional powers of each station. Ambitious presidents, the argument goes, will gain their power only by taking it from an ambitious Congress, who will be prompted by the threat to their power to resist the president's own assertions. This problem of ambition comes in many guises. And this is the part of the Founders' vision that gets insufficient attention from their defenders today. And this is what is most relevant for our public discussions today. Ambition is, is as much an intellectual problem as it is a moral problem. 
or rather, it is a moral problem with deep implications for the mind. Let us begin with the premise, granted I trust by all, that government should aim at the general good. Its goal is justice and the common advantage. The problem lies first in discerning the public good, and second, in enacting the public good. Each problem is complicated and difficult, and the coincidence of these problems is nearly insuperable. This is the ancient problem of melding wisdom, which is knowledge of the public good in this instance, and consent, getting the people to agree. This is, as I say, an ancient problem, by which I mean the problem was diagnosed by ancient thinkers with unparalleled clarity and depth. Plato, in his Great Republic, imagined that the rule of the philosopher king was necessary to a just city. Plato presents the rule of the philosopher kings as the last, greatest, and most ridiculous reform of current cities. His very mention of the possibilities of philosophers ruling prompts howls of laughter from the interlocutors of Book V in the Republic. First, Plato had suggested that cities should, uh, men and women, excuse me, in cities should exercise naked together. People laughed. Second, he suggested that cities should abolish private property and the family. They laughed. Then he suggested philosophers rule and they fall off their chairs. That's how ridiculous the uh, idea appears. Why is the idea that philosophers rule so ridiculous? Well, Plato seems to have an answer to this. Philosophers are not that interested in politics and their attachment to the city is tenuous. The people, on the other hand, suspect, rightly to some extent, that the competence and public spiritedness of philosophers is easy to question. The people are not wise themselves, so they have a great difficulty in distinguishing the wise from the unwise, the genuine article from the charlatan. In all cities, each group or faction has its leader, its representative, who claims to show how their passions or interests are indistinguishable from the public good. So the genuinely wise must compete with the allegedly wise flatterers for the city's allegiance. Those who do most of the living, dying, fighting, taxing in the city cannot, unmediated, recognize the conditions will make, which will make life, death, fighting, and taxing meaningful and best. This is a fundamental, and I think in Plato's view, ineradicable problem in all political communities. The people cannot easily recognize the public good, but the views of the people cannot be ignored. Ignoring a widely held view, no matter how erroneous that view, runs the risk of filling the city with enemies. To put this differently, political communities are caves governed by opinion which no ruler, no matter how wise, can simply ignore or disregard. This is what I call the problem of mixing wisdom and consent, of getting the people to recognize wisdom. And we should not be too hard on the people for failing to recognize wisdom. There is also a question, an ancient question, about the nature of wisdom as such. Plato seems to have seen wisdom as unpolitical or apolitical or transpolitical. In thinking about how wisdom relates to politics, our most reliable guide is Aristotle, who argues that political life is defined by a set of incommensurable, incompatible, but important human goods. The good for the political community is irreducibly complex or mixed, according to Aristotle. The public good involves some mixture of equality and inequality, freedom and order, wealth and poverty, and other things. Factions in cities form around all these goods, and all have different conceptions of these goods. What makes them factions is that they mistake part of the public good for the whole of the public good. Factions get fractions right and fractions wrong. 
There is no way to eliminate factions from public life, in part because nearly every faction, and every respectable faction certainly, gets something right. Statesmen, in Aristotle's view, must vindicate the, vindicate, excuse me, the aspirations of factions while limiting their damage and mitigating their tendency to mistake the part for the whole. So let me summarize what I mean by bringing up Plato and Aristotle in a talk on the American founders. Discerning what the public good is, is the problem of wisdom in politics, and it ain't easy. This task is almost immediately, or excuse me, almost beyond human capacity in the best of situations. But it is nearly impossible in a situation where factions have a role in choosing statesmen. The problem of mixing wisdom and consent, in other words, complicates the problem of wisdom further. For all their departures from the ancient traditions of thinking, the American founders recognized the permanent problems in human nature toward which these ancient thinkers pointed. They noticed the problem of faction and thought that it was a permanent feature in human life that could be mitigated but not eradicated and not overcome. The seeds of faction, Madison writes in Federalist 10, are sown in the nature of man. The founders recognized the origins of faction in man's nature, man's reasonable, baleful, fruitful tendency to prefer his own opinions, interests, and passions to those of others and to the public. The American founders realized that human nature could not be changed, and hence human faction could not be eradicated without also stamping out another human good, the liberty that makes faction possible. The American founders understood that all attempts to stamp man with the same opinions, interests, and passions would give rise to illiberal excesses, and that the attempts to assume that human beings had the same interests, opinions, and passions would be built on, sh on shaky, untenable foundations. Since men are prone to faction, they are prone to error. Factions cloud our thinking. All this means that the founders thought that the public good would be difficult to discern. They also thought that defanged faction would, factions would continue to produce leaders who claimed to know the public good, but who confused their faction's vision of the public good with the public good itself. This problem of mixing wisdom and consent would not go away, especially in a government founded on the consent of the governed. The US Constitution, or perhaps I should say the American regime, aims above all at improving thinking about the public good, while recognizing the threats to better thinking are sown in the nature of man. The United States Constitution sets up a process and a set of institutions where deliberation about the public good is most likely to happen. It uses the principle of consent to maximize the chances that public policies would reflect wisdom about the public good. While there is no guarantee that wisdom and consent will coincide, the American Constitution is based on the reasonable hope that consent can help achieve a more humanly attainable simulacrum of wisdom. And this simulacrum is deliberation. That's the goal of the Constitution. Let me illustrate what I mean before I get into the details of how this is accomplished in the United States Constitution. Consider an image of wisdom. A wise man, let us call him Moses, comes down from the mountaintop with a code of laws. And the people, after a struggle here and there, are impressed by his laws, such that they accept them as a standard. Here we have a single wise man giving laws to a people. Wisdom is embodied in and imposed by the wise man. Modern democracy, in the founder's view, with few, if any, exceptions, expects that there will be no wise lawmaker. No, thus saith the Lord, in political communities. 
the closest we can come to the wisdom of Moses is making sure that every proposal for public policy is vetted, is looked at, by several institutions. This vetting is designed to create the conditions for a careful consideration or deliberation about proposals for the public good. This vetting allows errors informed by factions to be identified and mitigated. This vetting allows various perspectives a chance to improve an idea for securing the public good or to stop misguided proposals. This is no guarantee of wisdom, but there can never be a guarantee for wisdom in human affairs. Requiring persistent thinking, or at least the forms of persistent thinking, does not guarantee the achievement of wisdom. People can always pretend they are thinking, and their thinking will always be clouded by their factional interests and opinions. But deliberation is the closest approximation of wisdom available in normal human life. The Constitution seeks to promote deliberation throughout, beginning with how the people's representatives are chosen and with how the institutions are designed to work. I think it is, uh, it, this is true in three or four progressively less important stages. The first and most important way the Constitution encourages deliberation, um, or I should say the first way it improves factuous thinking, involves establishing a continental country big enough to require representative government. This is Madison's famous argument from Federalist 10. The smaller the society, Madison writes, the fewer will probably be the distinct and parties and interests composing that society. The fewer the distinct parties and interests, the more frequently will a majority be found of the same party. Diversity is our strength, Madison, in effect, argues, but not necessarily in the same way today's advocates for diversity would argue. When people have the same interests, passions, and opinions, Madison fears they will never have to compromise. And they will rarely have to take time to move from an idea in conception to that idea in law. Diversity, or lack of diversity leads to a lack of deliberation. Large commercial societies, on the other hand, encourage diversity of opinion, interest, and passion. Again, listen to Madison. Extend the sphere, and you take in a greater variety of parties and interests. You make it less probable that a majority of the whole will have a common motive to invade the rights of other citizens. Majorities will need time to form because they lack fundamentally common motives. And this time between the thought and the policy makes it more likely that the policies of the government will be intelligent reflections of the balances of goods in society. In a diverse society, Madison reasons, a coalition of, the, of a majority of the whole society could seldom take place on any other principles than those of justice and the general good. The clashing of opinions and interests operates almost like a peer review process with the aim of finding the best approximation of the public good at the end of deliberation. If no policy is adopted, then perhaps none is at this point warranted, or public opinion is not ripe for that policy. Wisdom and consent, the mix of those things, comes from the deliberation afforded by diversity. The second stage in securing deliberation is embracing the principle of representative government. Representative government puts a distance between the people and public policy. And this distance encourages the spirit of deliberation to take root. Elections in a representative government tend to refine and enlarge the public views by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens whose wisdom may best discern the true interests of their country and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. Thus writes Madison in Federalist 10. Here I think Madison's argument is subject to an objection. Madison and the founders think representative democracy is a meritocratic institution. 
elections are one filter to improve the quality of the reasoners about the public good. Suffrages of people are more likely to center on men who possess the most attractive merit and the most diffusive and established characters. It goes without saying, as one might object, that elections are no guarantee of merit and established character. Representatives, after all, represent. Their views and character are affected by the opinions and interests of their constituents. Representatives still practice the little arts of popularity, petty demagoguery, and they display low or talents for low intrigue. Unimpre unimpressive people get elected. We might have a congressman, for instance, who thinks that Guam is about to tip over and capsize into the sea, for instance, an actual example. Have you seen Congress? Is the great common sense objection to the founders hopes in representative government? Have you seen our people? Is the best rejoinder. The best approximation of wisdom is to have many representatives to increase the likelihood that deliberation effectively happens. The third stage of securing deliberation is creating an effective separation of powers which will be decision points for all laws or acts of public policy. Longer terms are supposed to promote degree of knowledge about public affairs and tend to secure more long-sightedness. Rotating elections in the Senate promote stability in thinking about the national interests. Indirect elections are afforded by the Electoral College and perhaps by the original mode by which the Senate was selected tend to promote the selection of better people as well. The results will tend to be that the president and the senator so chosen will always be of a number of those who best understand our national interests and who are best able to promote those interests and whose reputation for integrity inspires and merits confidence. But what's more important is that the separation of powers slows down the policy making process. To be more precise, the combination of bicameralism, the splitting up of the legislature, and the separation of powers serves deliberation. Dividing the legislative branch into two parts forces every proposal to get two looks before it can become prevailing policy. In the legislature, Alexander Hamilton writes in Federalist 71, promptitude of decision is oftener an evil than a benefit. The differences of opinion, the jarring of parties in that department of the government, Though they may sometimes obstruct salutary plans, yet often promote deliberation and circumspection and serve to check the excesses of a majority. Bicameralism makes promptitude of decision very difficult. Adding an executive to the mix slows down an already slowish process. This is done with the hopes that the separation of the executive from the legislature will encourage deliberation. In discussing how presidents will sometimes have to wield the veto in order to protect the public from itself, Hamilton puts forward the point at which I am pointing. The Republican principle demands the deliberate sense of the community ought govern the conduct of those to whom they have entrusted the management of their affairs. This three-stage process, as I say, makes sense against the backdrop of the permanent human problem of identifying the public good and gaining consent for the public good. It uses the principle of a consent to establish institutions that promote deliberation. The founders do not isolate the wise in order to protect them from the ignorance and injustice of factions. They maintain important umbilical cords with the populace as a whole, and they use those umbilical cords to maintain and create the conditions for deliberation. Once those more able to deliberate are elected, the institutions provide an environment for slowing down the policy process so that a more effective approximation of the public good can be achieved. Finding wisdom and gaining consent for it are the goals of this order. While not perfect, this is as close to perfection as human affairs allows. It ain't perfect, but it ain't nothing. Now, how could such a scheme, how could such an order be vulnerable to attack? 
The answer to this question is rather deep and would require a long investigation, some of which is beyond the scope of our talk tonight. Let it suffice to say that we are into a second century dealing with a constitutional alternative to the Founders' vision. Progressivism, broadly conceived, rejects the Founders' view. Progressive thinkers undertook a comprehensive critique of America's constitutional principles early in the last century. And that critique points to a different constitution informed by different principles. I can summarize this, word, this critique with one word, administration. But you need more. If you allowed me a couple more words, I would add things like social intelligence and a new understanding of science. Newness explains why the Founders' thoughts on reconciling consent and wisdom were rejected. John Dewey, America's philosopher as some think, is rightly considered the greatest architect of the progressive critique of the Founders. He articulates the alternative view with the greatest force. What was new, according to Dewey, and why did knowledge of this new thing provide adequate grounds, in his view, for rejecting the American founding? and its resolution of the problem. So what was new and why did he reject it? In answering this question, I am tempted to say, look around at this beautiful campus and consider its ambitions. But let me not be too flip, I'll get to that in a second. For Dewey and his progressive compatriots, the essence of the American founding was experimentalism. So in the spirit of the founders, if not the word, Dewey insisted on continuing experiments. Subsequent experiments had, in Dewey's view, revealed a new kind of knowledge, which, if properly distilled and isolated from the public, could lead to a science of the public good. Dewey called this new kind of knowledge social intelligence or scientific control. The American founders had put forward what Dewey called the method of discussion, whereby the conflict among parties will, by means of public discussion, bring out necessary public truths. That's Dewey. Dewey thinks that this method of discussion is hopelessly naive. Discussion for Dewey means the triumph of symbols, mere words. And these words, these symbols, are masks for power. Dewey puts forward the hope that the scientific method can replace the method of discussion or deliberation. This means that Dewey has little patience for our constitutional forms. He has little patience with the clashing of institutions that could approximate wisdom through the, through the vetting of proposals. He has little patience with representative institutions that help mix wisdom and consent. Indeed, Dewey criticizes both the separation of powers and representative government as masks, protecting the powerful and as manipulators of language. Dewey's criticism, whatever the merits and the negative, is attached to a positive vision. He envisions a new kind of knowledge that will be more perfect, systematic, comprehensive, unclouded by prejudice or power. Here, the university seems to be at the core of the progressive vision. The university provides the knowledge. Administration must be empowered to put this knowledge into effect. Let us look at each aspect of the progressive project. First, the university. The task of the university will be to discover the new needs in society through a careful study of social relations. It is no coincidence that the modern disciplines of sociology, political science, and public administration, among others, are coeval with the progressive movement. As new needs arise, or as new oppression is identified, new disciplines may have to be founded to study them. This study of new needs must be accompanied by the development of programmatic ideas for satisfying those needs. Dewey could not be clearer on this point. He writes thus, discussion and dialect, or dialectic, however indispensable they are to the elaboration of ideas and policies, after ideas are once put forth, 
are weak reads to depend upon for the systematic origination of comprehensive plans, the plans that are required if the problem of social organization is to be met. Once thought adequate, discussion and deliberation have been displaced by experimental observation guided by comprehensive working hypotheses and using all the resources made available by mathematics. Once the studies have been conducted, we go to the second institution, the administration. Administrators must have sufficient independent power to enact these comprehensive plans. This means that administration must be separated from politics or electoral control. The field of public administration, whose seminal founders are also seminal progressive thinkers, here I'm thinking Woodrow Wilson, is also founded at this time. The idea here is that those with the wisdom or knowledge of the public good must be isolated from the people so they can act on the basis of that knowledge. Scientists do not take a vote on the principle of gravity. Likewise, those students of sociology or public administration possessing the science of the public good should not be governed by those unwise who do not possess the science. Administration must be separated from politics. This is called the politics-administration divide in the discipline of public administration. Now, while it may do slight violence to progressive thought, I want to conduct a short review of how progressive thought strikes at the heart of our constitutional order as originally conceived. First, the problem of faction is, in progressive thought, no longer decisive. It has ceased to exist because America is now truly a nation ready for national comprehensive vision implemented through public policy. This means that the intellectual problems caused by factions are no longer controlling. We can trust the centralization of power. The problem of faction is dead. We have achieved genuine intellectual clarity about the nature of the public good. Second, the separation of power system stymies the expression of this national will. So new institutions are necessary to make that expression effective. Perhaps the president will be able to embody this principle of public will. He will be a leader. New progressive institutions will have input or oversight from popular opinion broadly conceived. But the primary expression of public will is through socially organized intelligence produced by professional associations and given to administrators. Third, administrative institutions will separate from politics because this allows for objective public servants, schooled in the science of public good, to possess the power to implement the public's genuine needs. So faction gone, separation of powers gone, representative government gone. Now, I think that a cursory view of today's politics shows that both political parties, to differing degrees, embrace the progressive vision. To use only the current administration, its major accomplishments have been about administration. When the former Speaker of the House said that we would have to pass Obamacare to see what is in it, she was speaking a strange truth. Congress did not pass the substance of Obamacare. Administrators in the Health and Human Services Department had the vision of what is needed for adequate insurance plans and will inform, in fact dictate, the implementation of that bill. They will write it. The cost controls of Obamacare are to be enforced not by elected officials, but by an independent payment advisory board whose decisions cannot be revoked by Congress and which cannot be repealed by Congress. To use another example, also pertinent, the Dodd-Frank financial reform bill requires that over 150 rules be written by many administrative agencies. Chris Dodd, the, one of the authors of the bill, upon passage of it, said this, no one will know until this is actually in place how it works. Politicians in all these cases have transferred questions about the public good to those who seem to know and then isolated those who seem to know from politics. 
The best example of the, of the problem, however, is seen at the beginning of the progressive reform. Progressive's earlier achievements included the founding of the Securities and Exchange Commission, what I call the other SEC. That SEC was empowered to regulate unfair trade practices contrary to the public good. Well, that's easy. Those regulators must know what the public good is. That is precisely the complex and difficult work that the American founders left to the political system. But progressives, armed with their own confidence in science, believe that the knowers of the public good can be identified and should be empowered. This is fundamental to the progressive view. The scientific process generates wisdom about the nature of the public good, and mixing that with politics can only compromise the purity of the vision. The achievement of wise laws or regulations, to be precise, thus depends on the isolation of policy generation and implementation from the consent of the governed. The whole progressive project hangs on the status of the science of the public good. Now many claim to know the public good, as the founders knew, but few actually know it. There are three considerations, I believe, that tell against the progressive aspiration and tell in favor of the, progress, or the, the founders' vision. First, there is a school of thought in economics founded by James Buchanan, among others, called public choice theory. Public choice theory has as its central finding that public institutions have interests independent of their goals, their policy goals. Bureaucracies, in other words, want to survive as well as accomplish their goals. If they have to invent arguments for their continued existence, then they will invent arguments and call those arguments science. This is just one example of a more general idea or problem. Science isn't all it's cracked up to be. Often the prejudices of science cloud their scientists, cloud their studies and their recommendations. Just because this is so does not mean that science is irrelevant, but it does suggest that scientific claims must also be vetted. Science can be factional, and a process for dealing with the interests and opinions of scientists is necessary. It seems that the founder's vision for deciding things through the political process might not be so bad after all. But there is a more fundamental claim here that also supports the founder's vision. And I want to make this point very starkly. There is no science of the public good. Aristotle and the American founders were right in my view. Politics is necessarily about balancing public goods. Consider arsenic, it's a good thing, consider arsenic and pollutants. Scientists can tell us that arsenic is bad for the health and tell us at what level it is safe or at what level certain pollutants become dangerous. But scientists cannot tell us at what cost these pollutants should be removed from water or air. Every administrative decision ends up being a balance among public goods. Cleaner air versus the cost of cleaning it. Cleaner water versus the cost of cleaning it, among others. And if it is a balance, then why should we consider it to be apolitical or a strictly scientific decision? It isn't scientific. It is political. It is not to be decided by experts. It is to be decided by the people's representatives as they balance public goods. If the decision is about balancing various public goods, then the founder system is the best way for dealing with that balance. When elected officials get the balance wrong, we can hold them to blame. When administrators get it wrong, it's much more difficult to hold them accountable. There are genuine disagreements about the public good. The question is how to solve or mediate those disagreements. The founder system provides a venue that is skeptical of any one person grasping the genuine public good. It slows down the process, invites thoughts to be shared, 
errors to be exposed, and all with the hope of getting better policies at the end of the day. The public good, or its closest approximation, is arrived at through a method of discussion. There is no doubt something that is best for the country, and that good might be a comprehensive one. The difficulty lies in identifying what that good is. The question is, the right question to ask is, how do we discover what is best for the country, or who should rule? Nor should we forget the idea that people are self-interested and might try to secure benefits through government that contravene the public good. These difficulties and realities led the American founders to be skeptical of our ability to identify the public good. The Constitution reflects and remedies this difficulty. It speaks to the need for stability and leads to an institutional arrangement favoring a kind of incrementalism rather than radical change. It may be easier, as New York Times columnist Tom Friedman has wished for, to be governed by a Chinese dictatorship. It might be better as long as the dictator is enlightened. Enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm, however, as Madison warned. It is most difficult to identify them even when they are. The slow representative system of deliberation is the closest approximation to the achievement of wisdom that political life is capable of. The founders knew that, and that is why, despite progressivism, their achievement has lasted. So thank you. Uh, that's my rousing conclusion.